Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 22 of the Tomato Timer. And I think this is a highly anticipated one because joining us today is a software engineer. Rosanna, it's so good to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Rosanna, you studied CS and math at the University of Bath. Were you always excited and interested to study computer science? Did you know you were going to go on to study at that university? Um, actually, not definitely when I was younger. When I was younger, I really wanted to study maths. Um, so I guess I still half did that. <laughs> but I, yeah, I was looking at different courses for university when I was doing my A-levels. And I thought maybe I should do something else to make myself a little bit more employable. Mm. I actually went to a whole day where it was like maths and courses. So I looked at maths and business, maths and finance, maths and physics, and then maths and computer science was one of the options. And I thought, I've actually really enjoyed the computer science A-level so far, found it quite interesting. And yeah, hopefully it would be super easy to get a job afterwards. So I thought it would be a good route to take. That sounds amazing because um, I kind of was in the same boat as you. I was pretty sure on going on to physics for the first time, actually. And then I went to math and physics and then I ended up going slightly on the other kind of spectrum. I went, let me let me just go with the most unemployable one, just math. I know where it was. <laughs> Funny maths. No, still very employable, though. There's loads of careers out there for people yeah, with a maths kind degree. Of. Um, so tell us a little bit about how it all kind of transpired. You went to university um, and then you took a sandwich gear as well. How did that work? Yeah, taking a sandwich course was something I'd always intended to do. So once I decided I want to study maths and computer science, I looked at universities that would offer maths and computer science with a sandwich year or with a placement year, some places call it. And there really weren't that many options. So it narrowed down my UCAS choices quite significantly. I think yeah. there were only eight universities that offered that quite that course. So it made my choice quite easy <laughs> to pick five to apply to at that stage. Um, and then, yeah, I picked University of Bath. And the reason I was so keen on the placement year was just I thought it really would help. Like mm -hmm. you get a little bit of income for a year and uh, it kind of eases you into the world of work. And like worst case scenario, you come out of it with a year's worth of experience okay. and you know that you don't want that job. <laughs> but best case scenario, you come out of it having really enjoyed the year. I actually stayed for slightly longer than a year because I was, I was enjoying it so much. And um, then I found out just before I started my final year of uni that they'd offered me a graduate position back in the same role. So it, it made final year a lot less pressure. Didn't have to go for any mm. job interviews or anything like that. I knew what I was going to do once I graduated. So there's an, you obviously had the opportunity to go to, to do that kind of sandwich course. What about students who don't um, have that? What if what, there's this concept of the spring week as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I was lucky I picked one of these degree courses that offered it from the start. But a lot of universities don't necessarily put the help in to help you find a job or, or don't want you leaving for a whole year. Mm -hmm. So you've got the option to do like a summer internship, which works well after maybe your second or third year if you're doing a, a four year course. Um, otherwise, at the end of like or midway through first year, there's often uh, spring weeks. So namely because they're in April, springtime, and that would be a week or two of an internship. Sometimes these ones would be unpaid, I think. Um, but then if it is only a week, obviously, that's not as bad uh, as to trying to do a whole summer internship mm. unpaid. Normally, summer internships or a 12 month one should be paid, I think. Okay, yeah. And I think, um, well, it's sometimes a value in the experience does come through, especially when you're working for a a big industry or, or, or for a big company and then you can use that experience to then build on and apply to other jobs and stuff later on? Definitely. I think um, in order to kind of get onto a graduate scheme, a lot of places would be looking at who's already done work experience, which is ridiculous when it's your first job out of university, really. Mm. But if you have got an internship um, or some work experience under your belt already, then, then that's a really good thing to kind of get your foot in the door. Um, what does your current role entail? What do you do and how did that transform from the what you were doing in your sandwich course and the first kind of graduate job you got? So I think I've learned a lot more to do with computer science on the job rather than at university. I think it's such a wide field, which is probably true for most science fields, but you can't really cover it all in three or four years at university. And even if you can, it's so theoretical and you it's hard to piece it all together until mm. you're sitting down at a desk being paid to actually produce something. Yeah. So I work in financial technology um, and I used to work in a big bank uh, in, in the city. And um, so the side of programming and software engineering that I've been looking at is always 
I've, I would call it front office in terms of finance. So if anyone is interested in kind of trading, the software I've been producing is, is for traders, people who are technically making the money, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's so many different sides of computer science, even within banking. And that's just one industry that needs needs computer software engineers and developers. That's super cool. I know a bit about because my dad used to also like kind of tell me about front office and back office. I get none of that, but now it makes trying to piece a bit more of it together. So you're saying that it was kind of you learned a lot more computer science on the job. What do you mean by that? Do you mean like the the languages or specific skills that within kind of I don't know? Could you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a bit of everything, really. So because I thought university was quite theoretical, and maybe that came from having half of my course being a maths degree still. And mm. um, when I sat down to work in my first, in my graduate, uh, well, actually, no, my placement year, um, I was expected to write code for a whole huge system. And seeing how that kind of, you could kind of see how what you were doing was useful. And I really, really appreciated that. Compared to the coursework that we'd had at university, where 30 of you are writing the exact same code to solve the exact same problem. And it all seems very pointless. Mm. It's really, really cool to see that people are using your code. People really appreciate what you're doing. And it it is difficult to kind of fit in to to a team like that. You're not on your own anymore. Uh, You have to not just work around other people's schedules, like getting used to office hours or anything, um, but also getting used to other people's styling because coding is so creative. And there's so many different ways to solve any particular problem. And in a big corporate industry, there'll be conventions to follow. And it it's just things to get used to. Um, so I, I learned a lot on the job about uh, how to write and how to test specifically uh, for other people's code and for other people to be, then be using my code. So long after I left, that code is still going to be used. It was It was nice returning on the graduate scheme to realize that the code I'd written only like a year or so ago mm. on the placement was was still there and still being used. So that was a good feeling. Yeah, and and that's a very interesting uh, topic I'd like to learn more about as well because when we're imagining programmers and, and coders or whatever, we think of like someone sitting alone in a room in a dark room <laughs> and <laughs> just a black screen and just typing away at it. Um, but it's not usually like that. Could you tell us a little bit about like that teamwork atmosphere and what it means to be coding and programming something quite big together as a as a group? Yeah, you're right. It is completely different. Um, there's not to say that there's something wrong with coding at home on your own. Like It's a great place to start and to learn and practice. Yeah. But uh, working in industry in a team, it's so much more collaborative. Um, like Everyone's piecing different pieces of the puzzle together. You can't be expected to do something all on your own. That It just wouldn't be practical uh, when you think of the scale of the solutions that we're trying to build and design and, and like, deliver to clients in the end. Um, it, it wouldn't be sensible to say, yeah, one person's going to go off and do that bit and then we'll see them again in six months with a fully working solution. Yeah. Because it is so creative. There are so many different ways you could do it and you want to be talking to each other. So now that we're all working remotely at the moment, um, we have several video calls a day to talk about different elements. Some might be a planning, some might be kind of reviewing what we've already done. Some might be slightly technical arguments over the best way to do something sometimes, mm-hmm. but it's like constant communication. Um, you can't just go off and do it on your own, not, not in industry level, kind of not in that setting. Yeah. And I think a lot of um, the listeners today would also be thinking about pursuing some sort of you know, CS related job, whether it was programming or, or just being in that kind of industry itself. Do you think it was necessary for you to go out to get a CS degree? Yours wasn't purely computer science, but still. Um, would you think that it's it's really important to do that? Or are things like boot camps and, and courses online enough to kind of push you through in the right direction? So I really, really enjoyed my degree and I'm glad I picked computer science and maths. It was right for me at the time. But you do not need a computer science degree to work as a software developer or to work in other parts of computer science and other parts of computer engineering. There's there's elements to computer engineering and computer science that I wouldn't be able to do. I, I don't have a great networking background, for, for example. Mm. Um, but a degree didn't help me there. Um, it's It would be if it's something I'm interested in, if I've done an online course or if I've put some effort in in my own time. That's where programming at home on your own does help. Yeah. Um, you in an interview, they'll be looking for you to prove that you're interested, especially at a student level or in a graduate level. No one's expecting you to come in and be like, oh, here's this fully developed piece of software I've written. It's about being able to learn and and 
be able to like work well uh, as a team in, in that kind of collaborative place. And what would be one of that kind of, you mentioned quite a few skills there, but like, what was the most important thing that you found or, or you've noticed when applying to jobs that been, has been kind of like, you know, oh my gosh, she has that and that's why we'll take her. So I think that's a really, really good question because when you're writing your CV, whether it be for like a first internship or graduate scheme, um, it's it's hard to know like what's going to make you stand out. Is it going to be the fact that you've got straight A's, but what if someone else has straight A's or if you've not well, like what else is it that you can you can put on there that shows that you're just as good as everyone else kind of thing or, or not you're better and you're the person who needs the job so you need to have something that makes you stand out mm. and I think um if that be a project you've worked on on your own time that could be quite cool if you have done something previously or if you've attended some courses it's worth highlighting those in your cv or cover letter or something and um, I'd been to quite a few conferences and I think that being able to say that I'd presented and I'd won a prize at some stage was something that that kind of made people think twice before just passing my CV over as just another computer scientist kind of thing. Yeah, and I actually learned something from the questions um, today. Um, there's a question about any tips on getting into FANG, and I didn't know what FANG was until you told me it stands for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google or Alphabet. Um, any, and I, I know you just kind of mentioned to me that you went through quite a bit of the process for Google itself as well. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, this time last year, actually, I was interviewing for Google. I first had a call with their HR in January, and I think it took me until May that I finally got my rejection from them. Wow. Um, but I, I don't mind now. <laughs> I'm definitely quite happy where I am. But it was, it, yeah, it was a very long process. It was, however, it was really like clearly explained. Um, and obviously I wasn't the right fit for that role in the end. But in order to kind of prepare for those, I think you just have to remind yourself that it's not the be all and end all. Like there are four big, good companies, but there are a million other good companies out there that would be good to work for too. Mm. Um, I think a lot of smaller companies now do try and take interviewing styles from, from the big ones. I think a lot of the time it is stuff like leak code. I think someone has already mentioned and hacker rank. Yeah. They are really, really good to practice. And sometimes you can ask the ask HR in advance which particularly pla which particular platform are they going to use for the interview, and then just practice specifically on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know they're going to be using hacker rank in the interview, you you should be practicing on hacker rank. Um, but the sort of things that they're going to want to see is how you problem solve. I think is the main thing they're looking for. And I think that's where these like rumors of crazy questions like how many dentists are there in London? <laughs> they come from not knowing how many dentists there are in London, but from knowing um, how to kind of even think to break that problem down and to, to problem solve rather than they don't want someone who knows everything already. They want someone who can learn and someone who can think logically and strategically and, and be a bit creative as well. Yeah, actually, those sort of questions I've, I've heard myself as well, because um, I had like as as you've done um, a lot of friends were applying for graduate schemes or, or, or just summer internships. And, and they would, they would come out and they would be asking these like kind of really complicated questions. And one thing that I, I, I understood from, from, from that kind of, even though it was a secondhand experience, I realized that it really wasn't about solving the problem. It was like, exactly, they wanted yeah. to know how your brain worked really. They wanted to see how you were fitting that problem, breaking it down, finding different ways of, of like, you know, solving it. Um, and it was, it, I guess, I'm sure that you've, you're, and you've gone to the experience that when you're programming, it's it's those skills of breaking a problem down into smaller chunks and and being able to run them independently and then test them. And that's the that's the kind of thing that's so crucial for for your jobs as well. Yeah, definitely, I definitely agree with that. One of the things that you mentioned is that it's been a not a bit of a challenge because um, even now the kind of the computer science and programming and, and software engineering. Uh, kind of industry and, and sector has been there's a minority of women in there how has that kind of played out for you yeah I've definitely noticed that like the whole time I've uh, been interested in computer science so I was one of only two girls in my course at a level level out of probably about 30 wow. and then by the time I was at university I think yeah like five or six of us like enough that we all knew each other by name um, within a couple of weeks where uh, on a course of maybe like 80 or something. So uh, around 10%, I think it was. Um, and in the workplace, actually, I think it's slightly higher than that. But then I'm very aware that wherever I go, I do boost the ratio. <laughs> oh, no. um, 
Yeah, so it's it's definitely something that you notice and it's it's a shame because there's absolutely nothing to stop girls being good at computer science. Um, there's obviously a load of myth about uh, how it's a, a boy's subject and science -y, like sitting at home in the yeah. dark programming kind of thing. Like no one, not, not, that's not, uh, well, it's obviously not true, but also that's not attractive to everyone. Um, but that because that's not how it works in industry, like it shouldn't, and stop girls kind of getting into that field. I think, unfortunately, we still have some way to go before we get enough women coming through uh, the pipeline kind of thing, coming in through GCSE and then picking it for A-level, continuing to pick it at university and then taking that all the way to, to getting a job in computer science. But like I said, you don't necessarily need a computer science degree. You just need to be interested. So you could have any science or non-science background if it's something you're interested in. There's nothing to stop you picking it up slightly later of course could you tell us a little bit about the, the Ada Lovelace colloquium um that you attended as a student and I've, I've actually heard of it as well when it comes around every year um through my university as well what is it all about yeah so this is a really cool event that I first heard about in my first year of university we had a really cool uh lecturer who was advertising it to all the girls there it's, so it's a colloquium, a one-day event held each year. And then there's kind of keynote speeches, socializing, a chance to network with some employers. And um, it, there's loads of events like this, but I particularly enjoyed this one and, and wanted to highlight it because it is aimed at girls. And I think having a space like that is so, so important and having the option to actually be in the majority so there are always guys that attend the event and it's funny to look around and be like now you feel like I normally do at any other computer science related event um uh, so it definitely gives you confidence like to, to maybe just yeah. put your hand up and ask a question or to to go up to someone and be like can I add you on LinkedIn because you're kind of you're not uh like the only girl in the mm. room which which I know can happen and it is quite intimidating sometimes but you went from a student in your first year to attend, attending this to a judge how did that happen so I was a big fan of this conference. Yeah, I, I went to it three times as a student. I missed the year that I was on placement, but I went every other year at university uh, and presented each time um, and won a couple of prizes while I was there. So I was quite happy oh, about that. Congratulations. <laughs> and um, then this year, the conference was going to be held remotely because of everything that's happening. Mm. So we all jumped on a Discord server. It was incredibly well organized, like huge kudos to the organizers for that. And um, I was able to kind of go back and, and give feedback on the presenters this year um, and the students competing this year. And uh, hopefully I was able to bring my experience of, of presenting a couple of years back now uh, to the other side of it and to, to remember what it felt like to be presenting, but also still be able to, to judge and give feedback. Mm, that sounds so cool. And I think we need to learn a few things from that Discord server as well. Uh, <laughs> of our own. Um, and then you've also, like, um, alongside kind of all your 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 current role attending these conferences you've also been a volunteer for stem of course you're you're here with us right now but also code first for girls how has it been how has that voluntary experience been for you like i've um i've really enjoy teaching um it's not something i do for work but i i like being able to help other people um so it started i know like a lot of people on this server here and in, in this group are, often give advice and revision notes to each other and that's a really really good initiative so it kind of started, I was doing like A-level tutoring when I was in my upper sixth for some people in lower sixth. And um, then I've seen since graduating, and there's loads of other companies out there that do do something similar. So Code First Girls is an initiative for any girls, usually at university, who do not study computer science, but want a little bit of an introduction. And they've got a load of different courses. They've got some web development. I actually teach on the Python for Beginners course. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really, really rewarding to see in eight weeks someone going from never have written a line of Python in their life to presenting a really well written and really thought, well thought out project. And then being able to say, well, I've just done an eight week course. Imagine what I could do if I did another few weeks of self-study. And then all of a sudden they've decided that, yeah, computer science is for them. <laughs> so I think initiatives like this are really, really cool and really helpful to get more people interested in computer science because it's a very new field if we think about it it wasn't wasn't around like 100 years ago or something like that Not even like 50 years ago yeah this was very very recent that's a really important point and i think we've highlighted a couple of times now but th there is a potential for us to enter this kind of 
world of computer science and programming without having to study that degree at university or even know a lot of programming beforehand? Yeah, definitely. So I really wasn't doing that much programming at university. We had a couple of modules where you do one piece of coursework in in lots of different in each different language kind of thing. But I was not someone who was sitting at home coding on my laptop after hours. It just wasn't something I was hugely interested in. And actually when I filled out the form to decide what job I should have, I put down I didn't want to be a programmer. Um, and then four years later, here mm-hmm. I am, it's my day job and I love it. But um, I think that's because university coding was so different to to real world. It's so much more rewarding to kind of get the results and to to see how you can actually uh, be useful and be help- helping other people by, yeah. by writing and code. And talking about the real world, what do you think about the current kind of job market of software development and software engineers? Is it, is it something that's growing and do you think it will continue to grow? Yeah, I... I do. Um, Obviously, no one can really predict what's going to happen, but it doesn't really seem like an industry that can go away when we are going all so, so much for for technology in general. So it's not just coders and programmers. There's going to be other types of computer engineers and and anyone else with other types of computer software background that, that are needed for in these kind of industries. So I think I mentioned networking, but there's loads of like so many other regions to computer science that I'm not in I can only really speak about programming because that's mm. what I've ended up doing um but yeah I, I do think that technology is is still going it's not it's not slowing down really um especially now that we've learned that a lot of the time we might have to work remotely yeah. at least in the in the current times um turns out you can do that you just need a laptop and an internet connection so it is a job that you can do fully remotely um which always helps as well so yeah I think I'd can't really see it becoming obsolete anytime soon. Okay, it sounds like a plan. <laughs> sounds like something <laughs> we should keep working on. Um, so, if I was to uh, just for some newbies out there, what would what sort of languages or what sort of courses would you be recommending for us to kind of get started? Yeah, that's a good point. So, I use Python uh, all day at work, and I also use Python as a teaching language. It has a lot of scope. Mm -hmm. Um, So it reads very nicely like English. So it's not too crazy to pick up. Like some languages are a bit further away from English. And um, that just means there's like one further step of translation in your head that has to happen as you you try and write things. So it's useful for that. And it's also good as a teaching language, but also say as a sandboxing language, just to test things out. Um, Because you can just get it up and running. It's so, so easily. Um, anyone could go download Python from it, directly from the website, and then you, you're up and ready to go straight away. You don't need any, you don't need like, anything else, a fancy IDE or um, like any. You don't need a, a high spec computer or anything to be able to start writing a couple of lines of code and output something and yeah. and like yeah. actually see something happening quite quickly. Which I think is why it's such an attractive language, especially to beginners. But it turns out because it it is such a powerful language too. It is used in industry all across loads of different companies, not ju- the sort of thing that you need to learn and then move on from. Yeah. You, Python is a good language regardless. I do feel like I'm a little bit biased, but it's, <laughs> I, I, I don't actually, know if I'm allowed I, to have yeah, a favorite. I, I, I'm but same I, well. I started with Python as well, and, and it's been such an easy language to continue working on. I, I think I picked up JavaScript for a while, or Java itself, and this was so... I don't know. I, I shouldn't say ugly, but like it was just like not as fun because you had to sit there defining stuff. I'm like, come on, just I want to get to the actual programming bit. Yeah. And Python always lets you, as you just said, it's human readable, but also it's it's so um, quick to get something up and running. Yeah, it's rewarding that way. And that definitely helps. Exactly. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, the time has flown by. Um, I'm so sorry for. There are so many more questions to ask you, but um, what would be like one final piece of advice that you'd give to us based on? all those kind of amazing experiences that you've had to date? Um, that's going to sound so cliche, whatever I say, isn't it? I think coding overall is, <laughs> is it's really rewarding once you've got it. And it, I've seen that from from teaching and volunteer teaching. Students' reactions when they finally manage to get something, like it's really, really, like, it feels like quite satisfying to be like, oh, I've been struggling about this and I've yeah. finally managed it. So definitely keep going, but but also like have a look, like see what's out there. We've mentioned a couple of resources already. There's there's loads available online and mostly for free. 
So it really is, it should be really accessible to, to anyone to try and get involved if they want to. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us, Rosanna. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all our live listeners. We will be back with another episode at some point soon. Bye-bye for now. And that's another episode of the Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, go to xenos.org. Bye for now.